So, so far we've been studying ecological systems, and we're going to look at them in terms of soil, air, and water. So topic four is going to be about how this applies to water systems. Topic 4.1 will be an introduction. So we can see here this is a model of a water system showing the movement of the hydrological cycle. And basically, we're going from the air, precipitation, rainfall, and so forth, snow. Coming on down here, it can either go through the ground, aquifers, or it can just be runoff water, accumulates in lakes, rivers, basically flows down to the ocean, but it could also go through living things. They absorb a lot of water. And then the cycle continues and it goes back up into the air. And then um, it starts again. And this is necessary to uh, produce a uh, percentage variation of salt water and fresh water. So let's just take a look at where we'd find water. Obviously, we find the vast majority, 97% of water on this planet is the ocean. And the thing to remember is that's salt water. So we have a hard time using that water. The amount of water that's fresh is actually quite small. And it's mostly in glaciers here, about 2%. And the amount that's in uh, lakes and rivers and so forth is actually less than 1% or so. so. So let's just say, we'll round numbers off, I like doing that. Let's just say that 97% of the water on the planet is basically salt water, not good. And only 3% of it is uh, fresh water. And of that 3%, the majority is frozen in snow and glaciers. That, of course, is going to present a problem, and we have to be very careful about maintaining the hydrological cycle. You don't want too much of that water to keep accumulating in the ocean where we can't use it. So let's just go ahead and look now that we've disco uh, discovered the uh, storages. Let's go ahead and look at the flows. Uh, precipitation, obviously that's rainfall. Evaporation, water going back up into the atmosphere. Transpiration means it's going through plants, through living things. Infiltration means it's being absorbed into the ground, into aquifers, very important. Condensation speaks for itself. And sublimation, which doesn't happen all that much, is basically the movement of solid ice directly up into the air, not a big transfer. Now, human influences are really great on the flows involved in this hydrological cycle. Irrigation would be one of them. So we're really tapping into groundwater, into the aquifers, and bringing that water up. So when you, when you see crops being irrigated out in the fields, it's not like they're hooking it up to the tap. They're probably pumping water up out of the ground and then spraying it on the plants. And if you take water up from the ground, there's a fair amount of salt in it. So you're really spraying salt all over your crops there, and that's salinization. So that, that could be a problem. We also have a huge effect in deforestation. Amazon rainforest, we talked about that, really cutting down trees. This uh, reduces the anchorage of soil, causes a lot of runoff. And the third influence probably is urbanization. Urbanization stops the infiltration of water into the ground. And so most of it just runs off or evaporates. Living up here in Portland is probably a great air, uh, example of that. You just see water just running along. It's, it's not catched anywhere. So what is it that um, determines, really, the hydrological cycle? Well, it's mostly the oceans, obviously. We said that that was 97%. And you can see that water moves around the ocean, ocean circulation, bringing uh, warm and cold water currents. We're over here in Oregon, so we're getting a cold water current from Alaska. The water is very, very cold here. Go down Hawaii, you get that beautiful warm water down there. And if you put it all together, you have what's called a great ocean conveyor belt. And this is the movement globally of warm and uh, cold water. Now, this movement here will create lots of interesting factors around the world not just maintaining temperatures on land, but it also has a lot to do with salinization. Warmer waters tend to be saltier. Shallow waters tend to be saltier. And it also maintains temperature. So if you go to places, I went up to Alaska once, and Anchorage, which is on the, um, on the coastline, is actually warmer than it is inland. 
in uh, Fairbanks. And the third factor which this circulation affects is density. And density, as we know, depends on temperature. Warmer water has a lower density. I want to put this all together and just show you one interesting example of, of how this plays out, and that would be the El Nino effect. So normally what happens is that trade winds move from uh, South America over to Asia and Oceania, so it moves westward, and this drives warm water this way. So the cold water accumulates on South America and warm water accumulates over here. But in an El Nino, the winds change, and there's a movement in the other direction. And so it gets colder over here in Asia and Oceania, and it actually gets warmer over here in South America and parts of North America. So it's a flip-flop. And what happens then is that as the temperature changes, weather patterns start to change too. And so you start to get a lot of extreme weather. You know, hurricane season, for example, gets a lot worse. Um, and this is a, a repeating cycle. Uh, I think it happens like every 12 or 13 years. I can't remember exactly what it is. But it's something that uh, naturally uh, changes the weather patterns.